We've also got uh, a palantypist who's doing a live transcript. You should be able to see that at the bottom right hand side as well. That should say multimedia. Um, you need to click the blue continue button in order to see the transcript. And you can adjust the font size and theme or contrast if you're struggling to see it and open it also in another browser um, if you want, to, if that makes life easier. Obviously, if you don't need it, then you can close it. Um, the session is going to be recorded because we're going to be uploading it to YouTube afterwards. And obviously, we'll circulate a link to everybody um, after the session has ended. Uh, just to go back, when you joined the session, you may have seen that we've um, started with some polling. We've got a question for you to respond to so that we can get a sense of how effective this webinar has been uh, in terms of helping you understand how uh, understand equal pay and how to provide it in your workplace. So if you haven't had a chance to complete it, please do so now. We're going to check back in at the end of the session so we get a sense of, of, um, of how helpful the session has been. OK, so moving on, um, I'm going to give a quick overview of today's session. Uh, the reason we're running it is because the recent investigation we undertook into equal pay at the BBC has put equal pay under a spotlight and it's led to a whole heap of other organisations looking at pay, uh, pay discrimination, pay issues within their workplace. And we also know from recent research that we've done that employers don't make conscious decisions to pay men and women differently and that there are a range of factors that can contribute to increased risk of pay discrimination. So at a time when there's increased concern about gender inequality in the workplace as a result of the pandemic, the emerging recession, what you know, uncertainty around the impact of Brexit, we want to share some of the insights from the BBC investigation and explore what good practice looks like so that you as employers and equality and diversity practitioners are able to take positive steps to address any pay disparities in your workplace. So the session is going to start with a brief summary of, e of key equal pay concepts and then we'll move on to a short presentation on the BBC investigation and that'll include why we started the investigation, what the scope was and a summary of key findings. So the session isn't specifically about the BBC. The purpose is to reflect on the findings and the learning from that and look at how uh, we can support you to ensure that you don't make similar mistakes or that you can implement ways to change and improve practice. Um, we're also then going to kind of consider um, uh, lessons that other organisations um, have learned in terms of implementing equal pay and, and addressing and sort of avoiding risky practices. And then finally, we're going to open things up for a question and answer session. So speakers, in addition to, to commission experts, we're also really delighted to welcome Abdul Wahab, who's the Inclusion and Diversity Advisor at the CIPD. So many thanks to him for taking the time to join us this morning. So moving on, I'm just going to refresh our memories um, on equal pay principles and key concepts in Britain. So as I'm sure you're all aware, you know, the struggle for equal pay for women has goes, goes back over a century and it has its roots in the labour disputes of the late 19th century, such as the Match Girl Strike of, 19, of 1888, which led to the TUC passing a resolution calling for women to be paid the same as men. So as a result of ongoing campaigning and, and, and lobbying in, 19, in May 1970, we saw a landmark moment in the fight for equal pay. We saw the Equal Pay Act receive royal assent, and that made it unlawful to pay women less than men. Now, the provisions in that act were subsequently subsumed into the Equality Act 2010. But as we know, 50 years on from the Equal Pay Act, women are still routinely facing pay discrimination. Now, there's a clear business case for equal pay. It's not just about complying with the law and protecting yourself from reputational and financial damage. It can help eliminate pay gaps. It also contributes to building staff confidence, motivation and commitment and ultimately contributes to a fairer society. Now, equal pay applies to all contractual terms, not just pay. So that includes basic pay, non-discretionary bonuses, overtime, redundancy pay, sick pay, pension schemes and so forth. And the right to equal pay applies to many different work arrangements, including employees with a verbal or a written contract of employment, workers, um, um, apprenticeships and personal and public office holders. And it doesn't matter how long they've been employed or whether they have a full time, part time, fixed term, zero hours or casual contract. In terms of equal work, there are three kinds and these are provisions which have developed over time. So the first is like work, and that's the same or broadly similar. It involves similar tasks which require similar knowledge and skills, and any differences in the work are not of practical importance. 
work rated as equivalent is a second category. And that's work that's been rated under a valid job evaluation scheme as being of equal value in terms of how demanding it is. Finally, there's work of equal value, and that's work that is not similar and has not been rated as equivalent, but is of equal value in terms of demands such as effort, skill and decision making. Now, you can justify pay differences, but only if there's a material factor to explain the difference. And there must be a genuine, significant and relevant reason for the difference in pay, and the employer must be able to show how these factors were assessed and applied. So obviously I'm summarising, this is a whistle stop tour and more information can be found on our website and we'll be circulating links to that afterwards. Um, but obviously there are a number of reasons why there may be unequal pay in a workplace and Joanna and Charlotte from the Commission are going to be talking about some of these shortly, but I just wanted to highlight some quickly. And these include issues such as a lack of transparency in pay systems and decision making out of date job evaluation schemes, managerial discretion over starting pay and non payment of contractual bonuses during maternity leave. And while we know that lots of employees feel confident that they understand equal pay and provide it to their workers, we also know that pay inequality is endemic. There are daily stories about unequal pay across the private and public sector. For example, last year we saw nearly 28,000 equal pay claims at trial. And over recent years, there have been a number of high of successful high profile cases uh, against employers such as the BBC, but also Glasgow City Council and ASDA. And yet these cases are likely only to represent a small proportion of cases that could be taken and are settled out of court or don't even make it to the claim stage. And that's because equal pay often falls to employees to have to raise the issue with their employer rather than having an expectation that pay is equally calculated and that they will be fairly treated in the workplace. We know too that challenging an employer on the grounds of equal pay takes considerable effort and money, not to mention emotional investment, and also it does place a risk or a threat to the employee's livelihood. And while the law remains focused on individuals exercising their rights at tribunal, the Commission remains committed to encouraging and improving practice and to undertake enforcement action against those we suspect are breaking the law. And that's why we want to share findings from the BBC so that you can see how certain practices can increase the risk of pay discrimination and help you find ways to ensure that that's not happening in your organisation. So, after bombarding you with uh, a brief history of equal pay and the key concepts, I'd like to welcome uh, Joanna Gregson, who is our head of enforcement, and she's going to talk about our work with the BBC on equal pay. Joanna. Thanks very much, Rebecca, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, so, as Rebecca said, I'm head of enforcement at the Commission, and we have powers under the Equality Act 2006, which allow us to investigate organisations that we believe may have breached the Equality Act. Um, so that includes equal pay, but it also includes general discrimination, harassment and victimisation. So it's quite a broad remit. Um, other investigations that we've done recently have included uh, an investigation into the Labour Party around issues to do with anti-Semitism. Um, and we've also conducted an, a recent assessment of the Home Office and its hostile environment policies. If we find that an organisation has broken the law, we can require them to stop their discriminatory practices and to take steps to prevent discrimination from happening in the future. Or, if we think an organisation has broken the law, but the organisation is willing to work with us, we can choose to enter into a legal agreement with them instead of doing an investigation, where they make binding commitments to us to take certain steps to improve their policies and practices, and to prevent the risk of discrimination happening again in the future. Recent examples of legal agreements that we've entered into include Sainsbury's um, and Highways England, both of which were about sexual harassment of staff, um, and the DWP on race and age discrimination. So I'm going to give you just a quick bit of background into our investigation to the BBC. Um, and then what I think I'll do is, is I'm going to pull out um, three areas that I think will be uh, examples of practices that you may want to look at in your organisation, um, risky practices, which can increase the risk of pay discrimination. And then three examples of positive um, steps that you can take to reduce that risk um, and improve relations with your workforce around pay. So our investigation into the BBC started in March 2019. Um, and that was following allegations that were being made around unequal pay there. The BBC had started publishing a list of high earners, um, which included a disproportionate number of men towards the top of the list and in the list generally. Um, and, and higher paid women were, were then in a position to be able to compare their pay with men who were doing um, work that was similar or like work to them. As a result, they and other women at the BBC raised their concerns about equal pay internally and externally. Um, and we decided we wanted to take a closer look at the BBC's pay systems. 
So by then, the BBC was already making significant changes to its approach to pay through an ongoing programme of reforms. So we decided to investigate in order to understand, firstly, whether they were paying men and women equally. Um, and secondly, the extent to which these reforms had reduced the risk of any future pay discrimination and if anything further needed to be done. So it was a big piece of work for us at the Commission. The work involved an assessment of the BBC's previous and current pay systems, an analysis of their pay data. We looked at accounts from past and present employees, and we took an in-depth look at a selection of equal pay complaints. We didn't identify pay discrimination in the equal pay complaints, and we did find that significant progress has been made through these ongoing reforms. But we also felt that more needed to be done in certain areas. So we made recommendations around that to the BBC. So what I've done is I've pulled out, as I said, the three historical issues that increase the BBC's risk of pay discrimination, which I think will be of most relevance to everybody here today, along with three examples of the positive changes that they've made, which you may want to take away with you and think about. So first of all, what were the historical issues that were causing problems at the BBC? The first one, as you might expect, is really around the BBC's pay systems. Before it started its reforms, the BBC's pay systems were extremely complex and decentralised. For example, they had something like 5,000 uh, job titles for a workforce of about 19,000. What that meant was that individuals who had the same job title were sometimes doing very different work, and actually sometimes individuals with completely diff different job titles were doing very similar work. There were 32 pay bands um, across 16 grades, and many of those grades overlapped within the bands. And on top of that, around 10% of staff were being paid more than the maximum of the job pay range, all of which made their pay bands less meaningful. This kind of complexity can create a risk of pay discrimination creeping in because it becomes very difficult to compare pay across the organisation and to make consistent pay decisions. This can be even worse if, for example, there's not enough central oversight of pay decisions that are being made across the organisation, or if managers are being given too much discretion to make those decisions. It also makes it harder for employees to understand the reasons for their pay, which can obviously impact on things like trust and motivation if people can't see how their skills and experience are being reflected in their pay. The second issue that we found was historically that the BBC's record keeping had been poor. Um, this had affected its ability to explain its reasons for its pay decisions, both to its employees um, who were raising queries um, and to us during the investigation. It also contributed to, to delays in the BBC being able to resolve pay complaints because they didn't have the information that they needed to hand in order to fully investigate these complaints. So good record keeping is absolutely vital across all organisations. You need a clear and contemporaneous record of the reasons for your paid decisions. Um, otherwise, employees won't be understand the reasons for their, be able to understand the reasons for their pay, um, and you might not be able to defend yourself against an equal pay claim. And just as a reminder, the reason for that is that um, in an equal pay claim, it's up to the individual employee to first of all establish that they're doing equal work with somebody of the opposite sex and that that person is being paid more than them. So I would need to be able to show that I was doing equal work to a man and he was being paid more than me. But then the responsibility moves over to the employer who has to be able to demonstrate that there is a non-discriminatory reason for that difference in pay. So if you're not routinely recording all of the reasons for all of your pay decisions, so starting salaries, pay increases, bonuses, non-standard allowances, um, then you'll find yourself scrambling to try and find evidence to explain your, your pay decisions further down the line. And thirdly, we found at the BBC that there was historically not a general system for regularly reviewing pay. And we saw examples of employees, both men and women, um, who were going for years without a, a review of their pay taking place, which obviously led to a degree of unhappiness for some staff who felt that their growth in skills, um, in experience or, or taking on extra responsibility wasn't being recognised. And pay reviews are really important because people's, revol um, people's roles evolve all the time. Um, you know, often you'll find yourself being employed to do one role, only to find weeks or months later that you're actually doing something completely different. And this is really important in equal pay because um, when a court's looking at an equal pay claim, they're looking at what the employee actually does day to day, in addition to their job title and job description. So you need to ensure that their pay reflects their actual responsibilities as well as their skills and experience um, and that their pay is, is the same as anyone else doing similar work or again that there's a good reason to explain the difference and anyway it's, it's just good practice to want to know what your staff are actually doing and what you're paying for them for day to day so now i'm just going to look at the three three of the kind of positive aspects that came out from the bbc's reforms while they're certainly not perfect um, and in some areas we've made recommendations for further improvements 
I think there are useful learnings here that other employers can take away, and I hope they'll be useful for you today. The first one, again, as you might expect, is the overhaul that the BBC's done of their pay system. They've been carrying out a huge piece of work around um, creating what they call the career path framework, which provides a structure for um, defining jobs across the BBC. Um, and in doing so, they've managed to reduce those 5,000 different job descriptions down to um, about 600 generic job descriptions. Those jobs were evaluated um, and job pay ranges were set for each role based on market data. Um, existing jobs were then mapped across onto those new job descriptions um, and employees were given the opportunity to challenge the mapping outcome. Um, work is also um, underway to reduce the amount of overlap between bands um, and to reduce the number of people that are being paid above the maximum of their job pay range. To support consistent decision making, the BBC has provided um, HR and managers with guidance and training um, on how pay should be set. And it's also using technology and so it's introduced um, a data visualisation tool which allows um, hiring managers and, and HR to kind of see a visual representation of how pay is distributed across employees doing similar work um, and also data about those employees. This kind of granularity and, and visibility is so important in making sure that people are making rational and consistent um, pay decisions, which obviously in turn reduces um, the risk of pay discrimination. Um, it's, as I say, it's been a huge and ongoing piece of work, but it has provided a much more a uh, structured and consistent framework for defining jobs and setting pay. And th this is a key um, takeaway for all organisations, I would say. And we're going to talk a bit more about ways of doing that in the rest of this session. Secondly, on pay reviews, um, the BBC has introduced a system of fair pay checks, which they do regularly across the organisation. Um, and they can also be requested by a member of staff any time, um, just by emailing a central inbox. These checks can first of all be done on an informal basis, um, but then can move to a formal two-stage process if the member of staff isn't happy with the outcome. So the intention of the checks is that they cover two things. Um, one is that it's a check for unequal pay, if that's a possibility um, in the case. And then secondly, um, it's a check to ensure that the person is at the right point in their job pay range on the pay scale, um, taking into account their skills and their responsibilities and so on. If you're going to do something like this, a very important point is to make sure that if equal pay is potentially an issue, that you are considering that fully and separately from the general question of whether the person is generally being paid the right amount, and taking into account all those general factors. And this is obviously because equal pay is a legal question. It's, there's a, a legal definition of it and it's a legal obligation for employers to be providing equal pay. And there are set remedies that need to be available if they're not. Um, so if you are doing this kind of two two part check process, you need to make sure the equal pay part is being carried out properly. But providing you are doing that, um, this kind of approach can provide a really easy way for employers to raise concerns and to allow you to understand what those concerns are and deal with them potentially at a much earlier stage before things have to escalate. And finally, just to talk a bit about transparency, it, it probably goes without saying that you know, the more you talk to your staff, your employee networks, your unions, the better place you'll be to understand the most pressing issues um, and to address any concerns and to get buy-in for any changes that you're trying to make. Um, in terms of making information available to staff, most organisations will already be doing things like gender pay gap reporting. Um, the good organisations, hopefully yours, will, will be going beyond just reporting the numbers um, and will be looking at the reasons for any pay gaps that they find. Um, and producing an action plan to uh, set out the steps they plan to take to tackle that. This may be part of a wider piece of work or your ongoing work around diversity and inclusion. Um, so you might be doing similar around things like ethnicity and disability, for example. So it feels that we are moving nationally towards greater transparency on general terms. Um, but actually, if you can start to do that when you're talking to individuals about their specific pay and where they sit in terms of pay within the organisation, that's, in my opinion, the next step onwards. Um, what the BBC's done on this is they've uh, introduced a digital tool called People View, which allows an individual to see their own pay and where they sit in relation to others in the same job or band. Um, if the group's big enough, so for data protection reasons, the group has to be big enough, so you can't identify people. But if it is, they also show the difference between men and women within that job or band. Um, and a breakdown between Black, Asian and minority ethnic employees and non-BAME employees. 
So this kind of transparency is really good. And I, you know, I think it shows a real commitment to openness. And I'd really encourage you to think about this and what more you can do generally um, in terms of sharing information with your staff with the aim of kind of fostering a, an open dialogue about pay as much as possible. So I hope that's been helpful, um, but I'm very happy to answer any questions that come up either now or at the end. Thanks. Thanks, Joanna. I uh, really appreciate that. That was a really helpful and succinct summary of the findings from the BBC investigation. Um, I'm aware we don't seem to be having any comments or questions just yet. So just to remind people, the chat function is in the bottom right hand side of your screen. Uh, if you click on that, you should see a drop down menu. Please uh, look at that and choose everyone and that way you can add in comments and questions. Uh, and my colleague David is keeping an eye on that. So uh, um, and we'll feed those through to us um, for later on in the session. So what I'd like to do now is introduce Charlotte Billington from our compliance team, who is going to be talking about ways to eliminate risky practices. So Charlotte, over to you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Hi, everybody. My name is um, Charlotte Billington. As Rebecca said, I work in the compliance team at the organisation, which essentially means I make sure that it's as easy as possible for employers to understand what the Equality Act says and how you meet your obligations underneath them. So today, obviously, I'm going to particularly talk through um, equal pay and most specifically talk through three key steps to make sure that you don't have an equal pay issue. Now, it sounds obvious, and I know from uh, those of you that filled in the poll, lots of people feel like they understand equal pay. And often we're, we're really aware that people don't sit down and purposefully plan to pay men more than women. But often this can mean that there are assumptions amongst employers or those working in HR that there aren't equal pay issues without real clarity or robust checking that that is the case. So you'll have seen through uh, Joanna's presentation and the work that we undertook with the BBC that um, those assumptions can sometimes leave you open and vulnerable to equal pay claims. Uh, and like Rebecca said, there are lots of other organisations that mean that we see that some of those assumptions aren't necessarily living out in practice. So sometimes that means that there are historical or evolving systems, policies or processes that can create risky pay practices like we saw through Joanna's presentation. So I'm here today to make sure that you're really aware of what those risky practices are, um, that you know how you can check that if those ring a bell with you, that you don't have any issues. And then finally, help you understand that if when you find issues, how you can take action. So like Joanna, I'm going to run you through three key steps that you can check that you can run through to make sure that you don't have an equal pay issue. Now, the first sounds obvious, but uh, I think it's quite important. Check that you aren't at risk. So we heard through the BBC work that there are some risky practices or historical pay practices that led us to pick up the investigation to the BBC. So some of those were obviously um, decentralised pay systems or a lack of transparency in pay and grading systems, uh, having things like out of job, out of date job evaluations or things like having more than one grading and pay system, really long pay scales or overlapping pay scales and broadbanded pay structures. And also we heard a bit about uh, having managerial discretion over starting salaries. Uh, there are many more, and we've got a full list of those risky practices on our website. And if any of these sound familiar to you or have got your attention or feel like there's something you want to think about more, uh, then I would recommend it's best to make sure that having any of these, if you have any of these in place, that they're definitely not resulting in equal pay issues. And the way you can really do that, the, the only way really that you can make sure that you don't have an equal pay problem is either by running equal pay reviews if you've got less than 50 people in your organisation or by running an equal pay audit if you have more than 50 people in your organisation. That's the only way that you're not making those risks, that you're not making those risk assumptions and you can be sure that you don't have an equal pay issue. Now, I know that that may feel a bit overwhelming and a bit uh, like a long process to run through, but we've got really clear step by step guidance on our website, along with really helpful templates and examples like spreadsheets or equal estimator tools to help you with doing this. So we will be sending around our guidance afterwards. So don't feel worried. We've got that. You can go through a step by step process to make sure you have that. So I really recommend that if you feel like any of those risky practices ring a bell that you go to that guidance and you have a look at it. 
So if you do do that, if you run an equal pay review, an equal pay audit, and you find a problem, then uh, we would recommend the second step, which is to take action on that. So by running those audits or reviews, it should that process should help you to better understand why there may be some equal pay issues or concerns, which should mean that there are some clear sort of ideas of which actions you can take. So I know Joe Joanna just ran through some that the BBC took, like uh, overhauling the pay systems or evaluating JDs and jobs or um, evaluating jobs more broadly and also job descriptions. Other actions can be things like creating or updating your equal pay policies, uh, running a job evaluation scheme sort of as a foundational thing, which I know Abdul is going to go through in detail with you in his presentation. Um, and also things like making sure that managers are trained and there are centralised pay systems so that there isn't sort of disparity in the way pay is calculated. Again, we've got a step by step on how you can implement each of these different actions on our website. And like I said, I know Abdul's going to run through how you run a job evaluation or the different elements you need to think of in his presentation as well. So hopefully that will be really helpful for everyone. And then the third step, once you've uh, run your review or audit, you've decided which action to take and you've started to implement that, then it's really, really, really important that you monitor your progress there. So as Joe said, it's really important that you document all your work, how you undertook your audit or review, how you came to the actions you're going to take and how you've implemented them, because those will be really important for you to demonstrate your commitment to providing equal pay should you ever have a case brought against you. And also generally, it's just good practice. If an employee ever asks you or comes to you with a query, you're able to be really robust in documenting how you've tried to um, implement equal pay and what you've done to eliminate sort of pay discrimination. So we'd also recommend as part of that monitoring process, you undertake a regular review of those actions. And even if you have done an equal pay order, an equal pay review, and you decide that you don't need to take action at that time, it's still good practice to make sure you're running those reviews regularly to make sure you're still on top of it and you still don't need to take action. So that's part of, um, you know, good practice policies and processes. So just to reiterate, those three key steps were to take action, uh, sorry, were to check your risky practices, make sure that you've run an equal pay audit or review to make sure that you don't have any pay issues. If you do think you have a problem, then the second step is to take action. You can look at our website to run through uh, or get guidance on support on which actions you can take. And then once you've taken those actions, uh, make sure you're regulatory mon regularly, regularly monitoring progress and sort of um, making transparent bookkeeping and tracking what you're doing and looking at that really regularly. So I hope those three steps give you a really helpful framework to think through um, how you avoid risky practices and make sure you're definitely not at risk of an equal pay claim. Like I said, we will send around links to this guidance after the webinar, but we're also really keen from anyone who wants to share the work that they've been doing or wants to, um, you know, understand better or share feedback on how they've done that work or hear from others who have done it. So please do feel free to contact me after the webinar as well. We're always keen to hear from people. Thank you. Thanks very much, Charlotte. That was a really helpful run through some of the the, uh, the steps that uh, employees can take. Um, I'm going to move on now. I'd like to introduce Abdul from CIPD, who's going to be giving a more detailed overview of how to run a job evaluation uh, process. Um, and, and we'll take a wider look at best practice in relation to equal pay. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, so I'm Abdul Wahab from uh, the CIPD. I'm the advisor for inclusion and diversity within the CIPD's uh, public policy unit. So I, I deal with sort of creating employer guides, uh, liaising with government on public policy issues around uh, employment and specifically around um, <coughs> inclusion and diversity or diversity inclusion, whichever way. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, presented in your organisation. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a, a broad overview of job evaluations and market pricing. It's quite a complex subject, so in the, in the time allocated, it's, it's not 
possible to go through all of it, but my aim in this uh, sort of short presentation is to um, give a brief sort of high level overview and then signpost you to further resources and uh, guidance on how to conduct uh, sort of job evaluations and use market pricing as a tool for equal pay. So if we dive straight into it, so what is job evaluation and what is market pricing? So job evaluations and market pricing assist HR to gather data on the roles uh, in their organization and equivalent jobs in other organizations, uh, uh, sorry, other employers or sectors. And job evaluations and market pricing um, It and therefore is a fair and transparent way to compare uh, pay, pay um, data uh, and, and the sort of um, compare different roles in, in terms of pay. So if we look at the definition of job evaluation, ACAS defines job evaluation as a method of determining on a systematic basis the relative importance of a number of different jobs. Now, job evaluations are typically used when determining pay grades in pay structures, ensuring a fair pay system in an organisation, and when comparing pay rates against internal or external job market. Now, market pricing is an external approach. So, uh, market pricing is a way of collecting data on pay rates for similar jobs in other organisations to determine the market rate for different jobs. The, the aim is to set the employer's own pay rates at a level that is competitive to attract and retain the best talent. So if you look at the sort of rationale behind using job evaluation, so why use job evaluation? Now, employers operate job evaluation schemes for a variety of reasons, including the development of clear and orderly pay and grading structures and to help counter equal pay claims, something which uh, sort of uh, Joanna sort of covered uh, at the starting of her presentation, uh, which is an important consideration. Now, broadly, there are two main types of job evaluation. There are analytical schemes where jobs are broken down into their core components and non-analytical schemes where jobs are viewed as a whole. Generally, the use of analytical schemes is more popular because of the capacity to help provide defense against equal pay claims and the fact that it is, it is based on numbers. Now, analytical schemes generally, uh, there are sort of, there's two main types of analytical schemes. One is a points rating system and another one is a factor comparison approach. So I'm gonna br uh, briefly cover what, what each of these sort of consist of. Now, points rating, the, in, a, in a points rating system, the key elements of each job, which are known as factors, are identified by the organisation and then broken down into components which may also be weighted. Each factor is assessed separately and the points are allocated according to the level needed for the job. Now, the more demanding the job, the higher the points value. Examples of factors uh, commonly assessed include things like knowledge and skills, people management responsibilities, communication and networking, decision-making responsibilities, the working uh, environment, uh, the impact and influence of the role, and the financial uh, responsibility. So the CIPD's Reward Management Survey, which you'll find on our website, so it's a bit of a plug, uh, shows some of the more common factors that are used by employers to help them uh, determine which jobs go within their pay grades. And if we look at a factor comparison, now this is also based on an assessment of factors, the, the difference being that no points are allocated and so, so therefore it's used less commonly than points rating. What you'll find throughout this presentation is when I'm explaining a lot of these concepts, they tend to overlap and you, you might wonder well, what's the difference between each one. Uh, as I say, because it's a broad interview, I wouldn't be able to go into that much detail. So I'm going to signpost you to resources where you can look at these in detail. Now, if we look at the non-analytical schemes, now these are less objective than analytical schemes but I use because generally they are simpler, cheaper, and quicker to utilize. Uh, the approaches to non-analytical schemes include job ranking, paired comparisons, and job classification or job grading. 
Now, if we look at each of these in turn, so job ranking puts jobs in an organization in the order of their importance or the level of difficulty involved in performing them or their value to the organization in determining different pay grades. Paired comparisons compares each job in turn with another in the organization. So this takes longer than job ranking as each job is assessed separately. And then you've got job classification or job rank or uh, job grading, which is a, a, another name for it. So this is where the employer develops an agreed number of grades beforehand uh, based on things like task performed, skills, competencies, experience and responsibility. There must be clear distinctions between the grades. The jobs in the organization are then allocated to the predetermined grades. So these are mainly sort of internal based approaches. So now if we look at market pricing in a bit more detail. So market pricing involves matching similar jobs to enable pay rates in the organization to be compared with equivalent jobs in other employers. So there are a range of options for comparing jobs from looking at things like uh, doing a basic analysis of using job titles or job descriptions through to the use of job evaluation schemes. So this is where there's a more overlap where you use a job evaluation scheme with an external focus and then utilize market pricing. Employers, when doing market pricing, employers have to decide what type of reward they wish to compare. So for example, as Joanna mentioned, there's different ways of comparing salaries. You know, would you be looking at basic salary or the wider package, which may include uh, pension provision, um, sorry, uh, pension provision, private medical insurance, um, things like uh, benefit in kind, and so on. Now, in order to do market pricing, you need to have sources of, of pay data. So the sources of pay data can also um, vary uh, from specifically collected survey information to more general commercially available data. Obviously, doing a bespoke survey is the best way and probably the most accurate in terms of the roles that are within your organization, but there, there's a, a lot of expense and resources attached to that. So the approach that you take in terms of the source of data that you wish to utilize would largely depend on the size and resources available uh, to you as an employer. The, the four main sources of commercially available data includes published data from uh, pay surveys, pay clubs or employer groups that uh, would, uh, pay clubs or joint employer groups that um, regularly exchange information pay levels, special surveys which I mentioned which be funded by individual organizations, and you can also utilize commercially available databases of pay consultants. So these will give you data but uh, most of them would not be bespoke. We will give you an overview to assess the, the market pricing level of different jobs. There are also freely available data, which includes uh, the CIPD's labor market outlook, which contains pay predictions. So again, this will give you an indication going forward in terms of, in terms of it's done quarterly, in terms of the next quarter, what are the, uh, what are the pay rates in terms of pay rises that are likely to happen. Uh, so, this is broadly a brief overview of uh, job evaluations and market pricing. Uh, as I said, it's, it's a, a vastly sort of you know, complex topic, so very difficult to go into. I, I think I've already gone to, uh, I'm sure some people might be a bit confused about the different overlaps. So what I'd suggest is, and again, another plug from me, uh, I hope the EHRC don't mind too much, but if you look on the CIPD uh, website, there's, uh, uh, there are fact sheets on job evaluations and market pricing. Uh, we have uh, fact sheets, uh, podcasts, articles on covering topics like uh, pay and performance, and there's a, a vast uh, amount of data and information around things like gender pay gap. Uh, we're also looking at ethnicity pay gap. Uh, so I'd recommend you do look at that, and I'm sure um, some of the links may be shared uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, so that ends my presentation, and I'll pass back uh, to Rebecca. Thanks, Abdul. That was really, really interesting. Great to get into much more granular detail in terms of how you can improve practice. Um, I know that we have had a number of questions in the chat. Um, obviously, if, if people have more comments or questions, please do 
contribute. Um, I'll pick out a few for now, if that's okay. Um, from, um, uh, let me just scroll up, hold on a second. From Krishna Kaur, we've got uh, Charlotte, has the guidance had an equality impact assessment? And if so, could you share with us? And also is the guidance applicable to ethnicity pay gap issues? So Charlotte, can I bring you in to respond to that, please? Yeah, thank you for your question, Krishna. Um, all of our guidance have equality considerations mainstreamed into the work. So part and parcel of what we do means that we have that consideration through and through. So that's covered. Um, and also is the guidance applicable to ethnicity pay gaps issues? I would point out, obviously, um, the two different areas under the law. So obviously, equal pay is uh, a legal obligation, whereas pay gap reporting, ethnicity pay gap reporting is more sort of highlighting or demonstrating where there may be pay gaps and what you're going to do about it. So I'd say the different there and the guidance very specifically focuses on equal pay in this case, but there is still sort of, um, I think it's still relevant in terms of how you approach issues. So looking at collecting the right data, being really transparent and working with your employees and understanding what they need, um, action planning if you find pay gaps or ethnicity pay gaps and understanding what you need to do about that and building in regular monitoring I think are all just as applicable but I do think it's important to differentiate across the two so if you don't provide equal pay that's unlawful and you're not acting legally whereas if you have pay gaps that's not unlawful but obviously it is an issue that we'd want you to run through and take those steps with as well. I hope that's helpful. Thanks, Charlotte. Yeah, just to reiterate, obviously, um, uh, you know, having a pay gap isn't isn't unlawful. There, and there could be a number of factors, equal pay of which is one, which could contribute to that. And certainly commission work in the past has highlighted that um, a lot of employers don't think equal pay is a contributing factor to their pay gap. Um, if, you know, if they're reporting as part of the, the gender pay gap reporting uh, requirements. But we also know from our research is that very few of them have actually undertaken equal pay audits, so actually can't demonstrate clearly whether equal pay is an issue or not. Obviously, equal pay under the Equality Act relates specifically to equal pay for men and women and doesn't pick up other protected characteristics. However, the, the practical steps that you can take in order to determine whether there is an issue with, with unequal pay in your organisation, presumably if you have the the uh, the workforce data and you can disaggregate further by other protected characteristics means that you can use those tools and uh, and so on to determine whether there are issues in relation to pay disparity or discrimination um, in relation to ethnicity and also disability. Okay, um, I'm just going to move on. We've had um, another uh, another couple of questions that um, have come in separately, which is around pricing. Um, and Abdul, I might ask if, if you're able to respond to this, um, but obviously do chip in other panellists um, if, if you want to contribute. Um, are the necessary tools expensive um, and would it cost a lot to fix problems relating, re uh, relating to an unequal pay? Um, in terms of I mean, I don't know about fixing um, you know, unequal elements, but in terms of uh, uh, market pricing, um, as I said, there's, there, there are uh, commercially available um, sort of databases that people can access, and they're done on a subscription basis. Uh, they obviously don't give you very bespoke data. The most expensive would be to do your own uh, sort of you know, market pricing survey, uh, where you'd have to hire you know, potentially a, a you know, sort of pay consultants uh, to run a survey for you. Uh, uh, and which might be part of a broader job evaluation process. So it, it, I, I can see that, you know, that would be quite expensive. Uh, the, 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 you know, accessing the, the sort of commercial databases, um, the, the, there are different sort of price bands for those. And yes, they can be pricey, but they'll be less expensive than having your own survey done. Obviously, the cheapest is to access, you know, freely available data like what CIPD have, but again, it's not bespoke, but it'll give you a general idea of what the sort of uh, uh, pricing is for different jobs. But again, like, as we started initially, why job evaluations are used is because uh, job titles generally are not very reliable of, of the level of jobs. So you could have a head of marketing in one organization and you could have a director of marketing in a different organization and you might find that the head of marketing is paid more than the director of marketing. So it's, it's not easy to compare based on, on um, sort of 
job titles uh, that's why we, we do kind of you know, recommend doing a job evaluation but yes there is a cost element to it the more bespoke you want it the more expensive it is thanks abdul that was really helpful um i might actually um pose another a further question to you which has come up in the chat which is around um how should an employer respond to a concern or an equal pay grievance in the first instance. Um, let me just see if I can find the actual question. So, yeah, it says many people state that they're poorly treated when they raise concerns or a grievance about equal pay. What advice do you have for employers in terms of how to initially respond to an equal pay grievance or concern? Do you want me to come in on that one, Rebecca, not to jump in or anything? Unless, uh... Yeah, by all means, I'm just, I'm opening it up. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, yeah, it, it's a good question. Um, and employers really need to realise that they're, they're shooting themselves in the foot if they want to make it difficult for people to raise concerns. It, what it means in reality is that you end up with a disenfranchised and demoralised workforce and the only recourse that's left open to them is formal action. So taking you to the employment tribunal. Um, that's bad publicity, you know, all of your dirty linens aired in public, it's expensive. I know there's a few lawyers on the call and, and I'm a lawyer myself, but you know, lawyers aren't cheap. Um, and, it, and it's a hostile process, which, which very rarely ends with everybody feeling like they've won. Um, so really the only realistic option is to have a proper process in place for people to be able to raise their concerns and to do it in a way that is supportive to them and lets you both get to an outcome that seems fair as a minimum. Um, Ways to do that involve, I would say, making the process as clear and as accessible as possible. So having a written process, which is available to all staff on the internet or somewhere else, having clear timescales for how long it will take you to resolve those complaints um, and measuring yourself by your performance in, in how well and how quickly you resolve those complaints. Um, consider signposting people to sources of support and advice. So that might be um, your employee assistance program might include um, advice for people on equal pay and legal issues. Um, or you might have other internal support available. Um, the BBC's approach of allowing people to raise queries informally, I think is a good one because it's quite a scary process to raise a grievance, to have to kind of take it to a complaint level straight off, and that can be really off-putting to people. So allowing them to do it by way of kind of a question, uh, you know, I'd like you to have a look at this type approach, um, I think can make it really easy for people. And it, as I say, it can allow you to resolve these issues at a much, much earlier stage in a much more collaborative way. Um, and finally, I'd say that there's a point about learning. You need to, you know, complaints, we always say it, but it has to be true. Complaints are opportunities to learn as much as anything else. Um, and so you need to make sure that you're learning from these complaints that are being raised, you know, analysing um, the complaints that are coming in to understand what the patterns are. Um, is it in particular parts of the business? Are the same themes coming up time and time again? Um, and then working out what you need to do about it and actually doing it. So, you know, do you need better training for managers? Do you need to provide better information for staff about, about how you approach your setting of pay? Um, that kind of thing will really help staff to see that you are approaching this in a positive way and you are trying to do right by them, which again can often de-escalate concerns that people have if they feel that it's a collaborative process um, and hopefully mean that you avoid you know, being on the steps of the employment tribunal or virtual steps as it would be now um, and dealing with a really hostile process. Thanks, Joanna. That was really helpful response. Um, we've had more queries in the chat, so I'm just going to read through. And what I'll do is I'll open anybody. Uh, I'll invite anybody to respond. Um, from uh, Alana, should length of service be relevant when considering equal pay? If you have a male and female undertaking the same role, doing the same work, but the male has more experience in the same organisation because the female took three years out to raise children, is this fair? Joanna, you're on my screen. I might invite you to respond. <laughs> and you're a legal professional, so. <laughs> Fine, I, did, I didn't want to jump in. Um, it, it can be a factor that affects the setting of pay. I think, I think it's important to distinguish the difference between fair and equal pay. Um, the, I think often time out to raise children will affect people's pay and progression, and that will contribute to the gender pay gap. And that is something that employers need to look at um, as part of their broader picture around um, gender and sex equality in the workplace. Um, we, we do see some good practice around that, but it is something that you know, it, it's a societal 
ongoing societal issue that there is this kind of um, motherhood pen penalty, as it were. Um, things that can help with that are things like really good arrangements for parental leave, um, stuff like use it or lose it, um, parental leave for fathers, um, to allow the right decisions to be made, you know, for the person, you know, for how, how they want to address their time off. Um, but it, it's when it comes to time off for maternity leave and having children, that is part of the bigger issue, which needs dealing with in a more holistic way, if that makes sense. So I, I, I just come in there just to add um, something to that in, in terms of how, uh, you know, sort of time off for maternity leave it is uh, I come from the um, sort of higher education sector and a lot of female academics struggle to get promoted uh, because they're required to do a certain number of academic journals and a lot of research in order to get promoted to senior academic rank. And if they end up taking a break for a period of time, you know, to start a family, they end up getting penalised because they don't progress at the same level. So quite often the solution to that, like, you know, Joanna is saying, is taking a holistic approach, looking at what your promotional and progression processes are and how that affects, you know, kind of men and women and different groups. So it takes a broader approach. It's not necessarily, you know, I'm not a lawyer, so I won't give any legal answer to that, but in terms of equality and diversity, you need to look at whether your promotion structure um, sort of tends to favour men more than women, uh, what and what sort of performance do you value and the key performance indicators. So, if, you know, doing research over four or five years is important to getting ahead in an academic career, then that will, you know, invariably um, tend to uh, disadvantage women if they decide to go off and, and, and you know start a family for a period of time. So you need to then review that process uh, and, and look at restructuring and looking at other perf performance elements that can be taken into consideration in terms of allowing people to move forward. Thanks, Abdul. I hope that's uh, that's uh, answered the question um, uh, substantially in some detail. Okay, just moving on. Um, and this is directed to Charlotte, but again, if, if anybody on the panel wants to come in, um, could you provide some further detail on ensuring minimum risk in consideration of starting salaries? Uh, Linda's current Linda's organisation, their current default position is to start on the lowest incremental point um, or the relevant grade, but on occasion they've had requests from managers to move move on this due to their preferred candidate having a candidate having extensive skills or experience. Thank you, Linda. That's a really useful question. And I think, um, you know, there needs to be a centralised way that you manage that. So I think what's really important there is that discrimination don't come into those sort of requests from managers. I think um, having that minimum minimum start point is the best way to reduce risk. But if you are going to look at ways that you can, if managers are able to have discretion over that, then I'd still say that you need to keep a close eye on monitoring that and make sure that you are undertaking analysis to make sure that biases are creeping in. So more requests aren't coming in for male candidates, the women, ca female candidates, and that that doesn't give rise to an equal pay issue. So I'd say what your approach in terms of making sure you're set at the minimum is the most low risk you can do and uh, is, is really safe. But if you were to ever review that or you felt that there was a need to provide higher levels of pay or that you're giving managerial discretion that you be you really closely monitor that and you make sure that it's not leading to equal pay issues uh, by checking that it's not usually more male candidates that are getting that that discretion but I just uh, again I'm not a legal expert so I know Joe might want to leap in there to check through that that answer that I've given. Uh, no I don't have anything to add to that I was wondering if Abdul did want to but nothing from me. OK, um, I think also, sorry, it speaks as well to the point that um, Joanna was making at the, the start about the importance of documenting and record keeping so that kind of decision making can be evidence so that if there are challenges in the future, there's a clear kind of audit trail in order to determine why a decision was made. Um, and if that's then kind of supplemented, as Charlotte said, by the kind of ongoing monitoring and review to ensure that their sort of bias and, and discrimination is not um not taking place then i think that, that that's the uh, the most robust way you can approach this 
Um, moving on, we've had a comment from Stefan that our equal pay audit guidance is flawed. Um, I I can't comment on that. Jo I don't know if Joanna or Charlotte want to come in. I think it's certainly something we we need to look at. Um, uh, Joanna, again, you're on my screen. I don't know if you've got any immediate thoughts on this. I don't, I don't mind hopping in on that just because we have recently just updated that guidance with our equal pay expert lawyer. So I'm hoping that it's not wrong, but thank you for flagging it. And I will run that by him again, just in case to double check. But I'm hopeful that it is legally compliant, but I'm really glad that you've raised that with us. So I will run that by him as, again. OK, thanks, Charlotte. Um, right, where are we? Hold on. OK, so then we have a, a further. Oh, no, we've done that one. Right. So from Margaret, we have uh, we have a document that's in plain English that we use for all types of complaints and who they contact in each area. However, with all our staff, our key mantra is to communicate, collaborate and co-produce all aspects um, of our work with staff and member organisations. And this has really helped to ensure that we get this message out there and that we keep updating and reviewing. And this has been very helpful. So there you go. Some really positive feedback, which is lovely to hear. Um, yes, generally just sort of some comments about um, practice that other take. So Margaret has said in relation to academics, her university makes allowances for women on a career break, which is really, really positive to hear. Um, Angela has fed back to say that we need to hold the line when it comes to starting salary, as managers tend to think their new employee has a special case for a higher salary, but this is rarely the case, in fact. Uh, yes, OK, I may, may or may not have my own personal view on that. <laughs> Certainly in relation to the Commission, our experiences. OK, um, a final question, I think, uh, from Yvonne, which says, I've encountered colleagues who have or are experiencing undertaking same similar role as their peers, but are on a lower grade. The majority of them are black or Asian. Can I just check if colleagues would deem this equal pay discrimination? Um, so I'm happy to feedback on that. So the equal pay provisions in the Equality Act specifically refer to sex. So you're, they are particularly talking about men and women. So I don't know whether that's the case with your your colleagues. Um, if it's not, if it's about people on the same sex of the same sex, and then the equal pay provisions won't apply. But obviously the Equality Act um, still uh, makes it unlawful to directly or indirectly discriminate against um, people with protected characteristics, which include race among other things. Um, so while it may not be a specific equal pay issue, and this isn't obviously legal advice, it very much depends on the situation, it, it could end up being a, a situation around indirect or direct discrimination, um, but, but that would depend on, on what exactly is happening there to, um, to substantiate that. Thanks, Joanna. Um, I'm just having a so quick check. Um, through. Sorry, Ab Abdul. So I just want to add a few couple of comments on, on that. Um, as as Joanna said, you know, in terms of the equal pay provisions, it, it's it's currently looking at um, gender. But I, I think you know, it, once ethnicity pay gap, if that is made mandatory, ethnicity pay gap reporting, then I'm assuming that the equal pay provisions would would be um, updated and, and and altered. But as it stands, like like uh, Joanna just said, it's it's relating. Uh, uh, to sort of gender specifically. Um, CIPD is one of the organisations that's campaigning for mandatory ethnicity pay gap reporting and, and you know, not to plug anymore, but we, we do have we made a submission to government uh, for uh, ethnicity pay gap reporting, which is uh, available on our website, which might provide you with some uh, useful information around sort of ethnicity pay gap and, and re uh, why it's important to do reporting around that. Thanks, Abdul. Yeah, that's uh, the, the Commission's position is very similar in terms of ethnicity pay reporting, as you may be aware, the government consulted upon it uh, two years ago, in fact, still waiting for the for the outcome of that. Um, but hopefully we'll hear something soon. Uh, the Commission's position is that pay in and of itself in relation to ethnicity isn't an indicator, particularly of the barriers, because there is a a, a, a big variety of, of different um, uh, outcomes for different ethnic groups, different ethnic employees. And what we want to see is reporting um, on the grounds of recruitment, retention, progression, as well as pay, so that you get a much, much clearer and more comprehensive picture of, of what the particular barriers and challenges are for ethnic minority employees. Um, but yes, I think it's, it's um, uh, 
as Joanna said, the certainly the, um, the the broader principles of direct and indirect discrimination are certainly going to apply in relation to pay, and it's worth looking at those in detail. Um, Okay, so we have a, a, another question about um, whether compulsory gender pay gap reporting has been suspended. Joanna, can I bring you in on this, please? Yeah, that's fine. So you'll probably be aware that um, in March last year, we took the decision to suspend enforcement for that year's um, deadline because obviously we it was um, the first wave of the pandemic and employers had just been moving out of their offices, moving to home working. It was a really, really difficult time for everyone, including employers. Um, so we took the decision not to enforce that year. Um, we're obviously coming up to the deadlines again. We are intending to enforce again this year, but we are keeping it under close review and talking to the government because things are moving so quickly at the moment. Um, we're trying to strike that balance. It, it, pay gap reporting is so important and it's so important to us as an organisation and to society, in my opinion, as a whole. Um, the last thing we want to do is discourage people from doing it. But we need to take the, make a balance with what's going on at the moment, which is such an enormous amount of, on, of pressure on employers generally and on specific employers in particular. Obviously, pay gap reporting applies to public sector, schools, um, NHS across the board. If we suspend it, we can't suspend it for some, we'd have to suspend it for all. Um, so we are looking at that carefully and, and we may have to take a view closer to the time, depending on how things are looking with this third wave. Um, and, and we'll make an announcement if anything changes. But as of today, the intention is that we will enforce. And even if we don't enforce, the regs are still there and we would very much still encourage you to report because it's it's as much for employers um, for themselves as it is as it is you know just a legal requirement hopefully it's not just a tick box exercise um for people yeah thanks joanna um just to flag in the chat in case people have missed it uh let me see who it was um Margaret has shared a link to an article that she's written about pay gaps and protected characteristics other than sex. Um, so obviously we'd encourage you to read that. Um, Angela, yes, absolutely. Pay reporting is important. Um, we know that there has been a disproportionate impact on women as a result of the, um, the pandemic and the uh, recession that started. Um, and that does pose grave threats in terms of women's sort of future participation in the labour market. Um, we've got a comment from Emma that says um, she's noticed a big rise in Section 23 binding agreements. Will we see more of this in the future? Hi, that's me again. And yeah, I'm glad you've noticed. Um, we have, we've been doing quite a lot um, recently. We've, we've really ramped up over the past couple of years. We've really ramped up our, our use of our enforcement powers and the Section 23 agreements are really important plank of that. The, the whole of our enforcement is about getting organisations to change, to improve what they're doing, to stop discriminating. It's not about, it's not a blunt instrument for hitting people over the head and then walking away. It's about getting in there with organisations and helping them to change and to make things better um, for their staff, for their customers, for whoever. Um, Section 23 agreements really get us to the point where we're making those changes with an organisation without having to go through the rigmarole of a, of a large investigation. So we investigate if we have to, but if we can get to the outcomes that we would want to see with an organisation by doing a binding agreement with them, um, then that's a win-win because it means we start to get to the juicy stuff, which is actually the organisational change and actually the changes in policies and practices that will make a difference to people. Um, so yeah, there, there is a real focus on that and there will continue to be. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Joanna. That was really helpful. Um, Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask uh, our other colleague, Charlotte, to relaunch the polling question, um, which is, uh, as I said at the start, as a way, a way for us to determine how effective uh, you think this webinar has been in terms of understanding equal pay, how it applies, what steps you can take as an employer. Um, so, yeah, that's that should be on your screens now. You may need to click again on the, the, uh, the bottom right hand three dots in order to see polling. Um, what I would just like to do, as I say, is um, obviously reiterate that the because the session has been recorded, it will be uploaded onto YouTube along with the transcript shortly and we'll share the link with you. Um, if anybody has got um, additional questions, please either pop them back in the chat or, you know, we'll try and wrap up just before we go. Um, 
or by all means contact us after with any kind of um, particular queries or thoughts that you may have. Um, we have an action um, according to Stefan's qu uh, query regarding the steps in the equal pay guidance and we'll take that away and look at that now. Um, but yeah, otherwise, we'd like to thank you all for uh, attending this morning, for contributing um, your comments and, 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 and queries. Um, I'd like to thank all of the panellists, um, obviously, particularly Abdul for giving up his morning to, to um, contribute his insight and expertise, but also to Charlotte and Joanna for their, their clear and succinct contributions. Um, so yes, we'll we'll uh, draw to a close there. Another couple of minutes for the polling, but thanks very much all. Have a great Wednesday and rest of the week. And here's to greater freedom in the future. Chin up, everybody. Cheers now. Bye.